You don't have to make a whole meal of it, you know, if you're eating a stir fry of some sort or bake something. Just add a little bit of one of those new things into your diet and try to maintain that the next week. So by the end of the year, you would have added 30 or so new foods. And that will make a profound effect on your microbiome. So why do people get bloated and how do we, yeah, how do we stop it? Yeah. And, and in fact, it can be in many ways a very early signal that something is seriously wrong in your mm -hmm. system, right? Um, bloating should not actually happen. Um, and the way the digestive system works is that, you know, most of the fermentation that's occurring in the gut is supposed to happen in the large bowel. You don't produce excessive gas. So even in the large bowel where fermentation is occurring, you don't necessarily bloat. You don't ne necessarily expand the tissue to, to where you could see it. So anytime that that's happening, that's an unusual thing, right? But it's not always gas. And, and a lot of people always, um, you know, claim that bloating is gas related. But, and, and I'll talk to them and I'll go, okay, what makes you bloat? They'll go, well, I eat. And then like 10 minutes later, I'm bloated. And I'm like, well, that's not gas. Because just think about how long it takes the food to make its way past the stomach into the intestines, it's a couple hours. Yeah. And then for the microbes to start breaking them down and then producing gas out of it, it's another hour and a half or two. So the real gas-like bloating is when you eat something, two, three hours later, you start to feel bloating, then that's likely gas, right? Mm. That's not a good thing either, because then you've got too many microbes that are producing too much gas in your system. But I would say that at least half the bloating I tend to see and talk to people about is likely inflammation in the lining of the gut. So if you think about your small intestine, it's like this 20 plus feet of tubes that are all wrapped up together in a tiny space, right? And if, if the lining of each of those, uh, of that entire tube swells a little bit, then the whole thing just kind of blows up open and you start to feel it right in your midsection, Whoa. right? And so... When people start eating, when they start drinking, there's a lot of gastric processes starting to happen. You're starting to secrete hydrochloric acid. Your body's getting ready to secrete bile. You've got enzymes being produced. The microbes are starting to wake up in your small bowel, right? All of these activities may start a process of inflammation in some people if their microbes aren't healthy, hmm. which means that even water, and I've had lots of people tell me this, even water makes me bloat. And that's not normal. It means your intestines are inflamed. And so there's likely an issue of leaky gut, likely an issue of mucosal dysfunction and so on. So I think if people are bloating, they, they, they really should take that as a serious thing um, to investigate what exactly is causing it. I remember about a, more than a decade ago at this point, about 15 years ago, I um, discovered soy milk and I was mm -hmm. drinking a lot of soy milk. Uh, which I don't I haven't you know consumed in at least a decade at this point. But um, when I was first starting to explore you know alternatives to dairy back way back when when I somehow got convinced that dairy wasn't a great food for you, I started drinking soy milk because it was like the highest protein alternative yep. to be found at the supermarket. I distinctly remember I would have a few sips and then I would instantly feel like something going on, like some kind of undue fullness. Yeah. That wasn't commensurate with the amount of soy milk that I was drinking. Yeah, it wouldn't make sense, right? So when you when you think about it logically, it's not the product going in and filling you up and doing the plumbing-like things that we think about in the gut. Yeah, These are really immunological responses because your immune system starts responding to the food that you're consuming in your mouth, right? And there's something called the um, singular mucosal theory where all mucosal tissue in the body is connected. Hmm. The gut the gut mucosa, which is the densest mucosal tissue with the largest surface area and the most immune tissue is like the central command center of all mucosas, right? So if you imagine that your gut mucosa is dysfunctional, this is where most of the decisions are made by the immune system as to how to respond to the world around you, wow. right? This is where we want tolerance. This is something we call oral tolerance. So we eat and drink and we expose our system to lots of things. We breathe things in. All of that goes into the digestive tract. If we have a good microbiome with a, with a friendly relationship with the immune system, what happens is the microbiome presents these things to the immune system as things that the immune system doesn't have to pay attention to. Mm. So that builds oral tolerance. So the immune system goes, oh, okay, I've seen this. This is not a problem. We're not going to react to it, right? So now you're tolerating the environment that you're in. Now, if that communication breaks down in the gut and the mucosa layer gets diminished and the microbes start to shift balance and you've got more 
problematic microbes, so they're not communicating appropriately with the immune system, then that oral tolerance breaks down. So the immune system gets confused and it goes, we're just gonna attack everything, right? We don't know what's what, we don't know what's good, what's bad. So now the moment something even hits your mouth, your immune system's active in your mouth, that mucosal signaling goes all throughout your digestive tract instantaneously. Wow. And your immune system starts reacting to prepare itself for this thing coming in, right? So the soy proteins and the things like that that your body may be sensitive to, the immunological response was starting in your mouth and you would feel it in your gut as the tissue in your gut swells because your immune system's recruiting inflammation and other things to that site. It's almost like a mild like autoimmunity. It is, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a full-on immunological response, right? Um, it's you know, in the case of autoimmunity, your body's attacking its own tissue, but that's the same kind of response. It's attacking this thing that you should be should be benign to it, wow. but it's attacking it, right? And this is where food intolerances, allergies, asthma, all this stuff comes in. It's your immune system no longer tolerating the environment you're in. Mm. You're ill adapted to the environment that you're in. So it's unlikely to be. Gas, like the, if you, if it's something that you just consumed, yep. it's like there's no way that that fermentation was able to occur nope. in such a short time period. No, and that's one way for people to check, right? So I, I always tell people like, okay, if your bloating is due to excessive gas production, then what you should do is you should consume a fermentable carbohydrate, right? Take a fiber or something like that, um, or even rice or you know oats or whatever people want to do. They consume it. If it takes about two to three hours for the gas and the bloat to come in, then you're like, okay, that's likely a gas issue. But with that, you'll also have flatulence. You'll also have burping, right? So gas has to come out one way or the other. Yeah. So you'll experience those things. But if you consume something, like in your case, you, you have a glass of soy milk, and then within minutes, you're bloating, you're feeling full. Yeah. That's not gas, right? Mm. That's an immunological <clears throat> response that's not great for wow. your system. Wow. Yeah. So interesting. On the other hand, you can, if you are like a, if you eat very quickly, right, mm -hmm. you can potentially swallow air. So that is one potential route to, to allowing, you know, one point of entry for gas to enter the, the uh, GI tract, right? You can, yeah. Now, a lot of that will, will dissipate, right, um, through the stomach, through the small intestine. Um, you'd have to really be eating quite voraciously hmm. for there to be enough uh, gas to come in that actually bloats you. Uh, drinking certainly wouldn't do it, right? Um, but I, I think from what I see, at least half of what I see as bloating when I, when I work with people and interact with people is likely inflammation hmm. and not gas. Uh, and that inflammation can have a lot of profound effects down the road. Yeah, well, I want to talk about that because the gut really is, almost all disease stems from the gut in one way yeah. or another, um, particularly the kinds of diseases that we're now seeing run rampant in society, the non-communicable chronic conditions that are characterized at least in part by low-grade chronic inflammation. Yep. Yeah. Um, is there a way to test? The, I mean, should people be getting, you know, because obviously people get physicals, one of the standard tests I think that, that most people get run on a physical is the like the CRP, you know, yep. which which measures inflammation. But is are there any other ways to measure to to know for sure if it's if their inflammation is coming from their gut? Yeah, there's a couple of things. So um, and to put a to put an even finer point on what you said about um, most diseases stemming from the gut, right? There was a 2015 publication in Frontiers of Immunology. This was a meta analysis paper, so it was a paper looking at lots of papers on the subject. They concluded that leaky gut or intestinal permeability that was predominantly driven by stress, and we could talk about how stress causes leaky gut, yeah. was the number one uh, cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. It's the number one killer. Whoa. Right? This kills more people than anything else worldwide. That's a big deal. It's huge, right? It's huge. Leaky the, gut or leaky like gut. In intestinal permeability. Yep. And so, and what happens at leaky gut is a translocation of toxins bacterial toxins that are produced in the in the gut, which is completely normal, right? M microbes will produce these things, they use them for other reasons, they're not trying to poison us. But if the barrier is compromised, it'll, it will leak through. And once it leaks through, it creates this chronic low-grade inflammation. Um, there's a particular toxin called LPS, lipopolysaccharide, that has its way of getting into many areas like the brain. And we'll, we'll talk about how that impacts anxiety, depression, and then long-term issues like Alzheimer's, dementia, and all that. And I'll, I'll make a, um, a claim. It's, it's, it's my 
uh, hypothesis and understanding, and, and I do this lecture to, to doctors and all the time, that what we experience today as anxiety or depression is actually pre-Alzheimer's or pre-dementia. Mm. It's the early, early symptoms and stages of Alzheimer's and dementia, and we'll explain wh why that is, right? Um, but to go back to your question about how do you test for it, so there are some immunological tests you can do because these are immune responses that are typically driven largely by gut inflammation, right? So uh, one of them that's a general inflammatory um, cytokine is IL-6, interleukin-6. But we see in almost every research paper where you have intestinal permeability, leaky gut, driving massive amounts of inflammation, you ha tend to get IL-6 elevated hmm. significantly. Uh, the other one is interleukin-1 beta, IL-1 beta. Uh, the third one is MCP-1. So MCP-1 is a chemokine, which means that it's a immune signal that recruits immune cells to a given area. We've used that in a couple of studies we've published on leaky gut, where we show that when people have leaky gut and we can measure the amount of endotoxins moving through, that MCP-1 tends to be really high, right? Because uh, the gut lining is, is a war zone, if you will, and your immune cells are going, we need all the help we can get. So they keep recruiting immune cells to that region. Hmm. So you see that in elevated MCP-1. And when we alleviate the, the leakiness in the gut, then the MCP-1 comes down dramatically, wow. right? So those, and then there's another one that, that has been used in HIV studies on intestinal permeability. And the reason why it's used on that is because uh, I think it was the NIH had published a study showing that the best predictor of mortality in even HIV was the degree of intestinal permeability they hmm. had, not viral load anymore, right? So, so they showed one called soluble CD14, SCD14. So most of these can be done by your regular doctor. They're on immune panels and all that. You just have to ask for it, right? So if you look at those and those tend to be elevated, then you know, okay, you've got a real inflammatory process going on in the body. Wow. And are they, I mean, I guess the best test would be to, to eat something that you believe is causing you this inflammation, right? And then to go and measure these, like, these cytokines. Yep, that's exactly. So uh, in fact, uh, you, what you do is you get a blood draw when you're fasted. Mm -hmm. So you go into your doctor or health practitioner, do it in a fasted state, and then go off and eat a meal and then come back about four hours after the meal and get a second draw. And if you see this big delta in these inflammatory cytokines, it absolutely means you have inflammation driven by leaky gut. Wow. Right? So we call this uh, postprandial endotoxemia is hmm. the official word for it. Um, and what you see is about a six-fold increase in many of these cytokines. So, and it can take the body, if your gut is leaky, it can take the body upwards of two weeks to recover from the inflammation from a single meal. Because it's like mild sepsis in a way, it's, isn't it? It's exactly that, yeah. It is essentially sepsis happening in your body, right? So your barrier is broken up, microbes are, are, are uh, moving through, translocating through, their components are moving through, and your body treats that as septicemia. So it elicits a response that is so profound as if the host is about to die. Right. And imagine that sepsis can be happening in your brain, that sepsis can be happening in your heart, in your joints, almost anywhere, wherever the toxins make their way to it. Right. And this is why it becomes the number one cause of death. Damn. Right. That is crazy. So what causes leaky gut? What do we do about this? So the first uh, thing that occurs in leaky gut is a change in the microbial population. So um, when you look at the lining of the gut, right, so you've got this massive amount of surface area. So if you unfold all your intestines, you've got the surface area of a professional tennis court. It's huge, hmm. right? Um, that surface area is, has a single cell barrier, which is one cell thick that separates the outside world from the inside your blood supply, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not a very good barrier. When you compare that to like your skin as a barrier, for example, your skin has multiple layers of dead cells, then live cells, then different types of live cells, right? That's a true barrier. This is one cell thick, these poor cells sitting next to each other, shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> and the problem with them is that they're supposed to let a bunch of stuff through, but then there's also not supposed to let a lot of things through, right? Mm. So it's more of a dynamic barrier. It's supposed to let nutrients in and all that, but then close off to things that it's not supposed to. So how do those cells know what to let through and what not to let through? Well, 
there's a couple of things that are happening. Number one, on top of those cells, you've got this mucus layer. The mucus layer is really, really important. And within the mucus layer, you actually have two distinct layers. You've got the inner mucosa, which is actually relatively thick. Think of it like jello-like structure. And then you've got the outer mucin 2 layer. That's a little bit more liquid-like layer, and that's where all the microbes live right? This mucin 2 layer is the only sterile part of your body. There's no other part of your body that's sterile. Your brain, your eyeballs, your cerebral spinal fluid, everything's full of microbes, right? Wow. The only sterile part of your body is the part right next to the highest density of microbes in your body, right? So this is very deliberate biology. And it's really interesting to see like an electron micrograph of this, right? You see trillions of bacteria here. You see the immune cells down here. And right in between is a demilitarized zone, yeah. right? Nobody goes there, Wow. right? And, and that biology is very deliberate. So what that provides these cells that are sitting there shoulder to shoulder is it number one, it provides some communication from the microbes in the top layer. It provides a conduit to talk to them, right? So the microbes are flagging things that are coming through and going, you need to pay attention to this or you don't need to pay attention to that, right? So that's where the crosstalk is happening. The other thing is it's slowing things down as it migrates through, right? So now nutrients, microbes, viruses, all of that slow down as it's making its way through this media, if you will. That gives the time for the immune system to anal uh, analyze everything that's coming through and decide, do we need to mount a response or not? This also gives time for the cells that are sitting shoulder to shoulder to go, ah, we need that to come through. Let's open up the space in between, right? So there's these proteins, tight junction proteins that maintain that space in between the cells. So they open up, things go through, they cinch back close, right? Now, some things will go right through the cells. So that's called a transcellular pathway. Like... Uh, you know, magnesium, calcium, these kind of things will go right through the cell. So that mucosal structure and that communication between the microbiome and the immune system is absolutely critical in maintaining the barrier structure of the gut, hmm. right? If those structures aren't in place, you've got one cell layer that's just going to be penetrated easily. So the first thing that goes wrong in leaky gut is you start to see an imbalance of microbes that rebuild and maintain that mucosal layer versus microbes that eat away at the mucosal layer. Interesting. Yeah, that's the most fundamental form of dysbiosis, right? Mm. That, that's a term that we use for like an imbalance of microbes. So when you start to see too many microbes that eat that mucin layer, that, that demilitarized zone part of the mucin layer, versus stimulating the rebuilding of it, what happens over time is you get a net reduction in that demilitarized zone the microbes that are in the first layer come too close to the intestinal epithelium, so you no longer have that demilitarized zone. So number one, things are moving through much faster. Mm. You've got loss of communication between the microbiome and the immune system because now you're shifting the microbiome. You have fewer players that are working with the immune system to communicate about the world around you. And on top of that, you've got the immune cells that are sitting there with the intestinal epithelial cells that are getting very nervous that you're about to undergo sepsis because now you've got trillions of bacteria that are too close to the final barrier before things enter your blood, right? So then the immune system starts overreacting and starts recruiting and sending things in that region. Mm. And so now often what happens is the damage that leads to profound intestinal permeability actually is done by the immune response wow. to that region, right? This is why it comes back to that inflammation we were talking about earlier. If you drink something like a cup of soy milk and you start to feel that distension and fullness and all that, it likely means that there's an inflammatory response going on in the lining of your gut, hmm. right? The soy proteins or whatever the aspects of the pro of the soys, maybe the estrogen mimics or whatever it may be, are triggering a profound immunological response in the lining of your gut, wow. right? Then your immune system is moving into that area and it's starting to diminish the barrier function of your gut. So hmm. that keeps up then at one point you're going to have profound leakiness and that's going to spiral into all kinds of other conditions. How concerned are you about processed food additives in all this? Really, really concerned because, you know, when you, when you look at how something gets approved to be used in food, right, um, they never test it 
on the microbiome. Interesting. Right? This is a completely new concept now, right? Mm. The microbiome is something that we only learned about over the last 10 years. Uh, most of these food additives were approved decades ago. Mm. Uh, you look at Roundup, for example, right? Yeah. Roundup was approved in the 70s. Uh, we didn't even know the microbiome existed then. And so it was never tested on the microbiome. And now when you look at safety studies that are required to prove that something is quote unquote safe for human consumption, it's a typically a 28 day or 90 day feeding study. Mm. What does that mean? That means you take a bunch of uh, rats or mice, you feed them the food for 28 days, or you feed them for 90 days, and typically it's a dose that, that's higher than the human would consume, and then you see if they die. Right. Right? And then if they don't die, you, of course, you kill them, and then you open them up, and you look at the organs and see that any organs get damaged and so on. Hmm. In that period of time, most things aren't going to cause severe damage. Right. Right. And you're not looking at their microbiome. You're not looking at the impact on the, the ecosystem within the gut. Uh, you're not looking at immunological responses within the gut. You're not looking at the damage to the ecology mm. of, the, of the body, right? And so most of those things have not been tested on the microbiome. And most of those things are going to impact the microbiome in one way or the other. Yeah, so basically like a lot of these industrial chemicals that are now routinely added to our ultra processed foods food supply yeah they're given to animals to see if at a certain dose the animal they'll kill the animal mm. but other than that they're not really tested within the context of the microbiome they're not and which means that they're not text they're not testing it in the context of the human system right mm. um they don't do human safety studies on these products they they do animal safety studies um and and we know that translationally animal physiology doesn't translate well to human physiology in most studies where we start with animals right so most microbiome studies at some point you're starting with a mouse model or, or an in vitro model of some mm. sort and then often when you translate it to humans it doesn't translate completely well so even if you're looking at microbiome specifically it may not necessarily translate so you know at the end of the day you know it's it there's no comfort in knowing that, hey, this food is sitting on the shelf, that means it must be FDA approved. That means it must be legal, which means it must be safe. Hmm. There's no comfort in that at all, hmm. right? The only thing that we can hold true is that real food is likely okay, and things that aren't real, things that have lots of process and packaging and all that stuff will likely harm your system in one way or the other. And it's also like precautionary principle, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the less time a food or a compound has spent with ex with human exposure, right? The I think more skeptical we should be about its about its short-term and long-term impact on That's right. on our health. Yeah. And and anything that enhances a feature of the food, right? The color of the food, the texture of the food, the um the preservation, the shelf life, all yeah. of those things are things that are not at all natural to our physiology. And they're not being added to improve the nutritional quality of the not food, at all, right? No. They're being added to again improve like what is essentially the bottom line, yeah. shelf stability, etc. The visual component of it. Um and you know, I mentioned leaky gut starts with that imbalance of microbes that eat away at the mucin layer versus rebuild it, right? And there are lots of key microbes that continuously rebuild the mucin layer and maintain that structure. So then what are some of the things that drive that imbalance to begin with? And processed foods is one of those things, mm. right? So uh, take Roundup, for example, right? If you, if you eat foods with, that have a lot of pesticides on it, Roundup, for example, is selectively killing good bacteria. Oof. It's an antibiotic, right? So they, they uh, you know, the company Monsanto had filed in the 1970s a patent to use it as an antibiotic. So we know it's an antibiotic. But it's a worse kind of antibiotic because most antibiotics will just kill everything. Hmm. This antibiotic selectively kills beneficial bacteria and, and selects for pathogens because there's lots of pathogens in the gut that have a workaround for the way this interferes with the biochemistry, right? And so over time, when you get small doses of it in each food product, what you're doing is over time creating a new ecosystem in your gut where you have a high pathogen load and you've got low levels of good bacteria that maintain the structure and all that, right? Mm. So I would say that, you know, majority of people that have leaky gut, which actually is the majority of adults in the US, in the Western world, likely started with a food choice or two and and what they were fed as kids and so on 
How worrying is glyphosate? I mean, as far as I know, it's a water-soluble compound. Is it something that is just rinsed off when you rinse your produce? No, unfortunately, it gets into the the cellular structure Whoa. of the of the uh, food products. Um, so you can't necessarily rinse it off. You will consume it. Uh, we're finding glyphosate in, in umbilical cords and cord blood in newborns, oh, right? God. I mean, it's so pervasive. It's everywhere. Uh, we published a study with King's College in London, um, and we did this study on, on what is a th- pristine three-year-old's microbiome. So there's this um, microbiome modeling system that we use called a Shime model. It's basically a mechanical gut that exists from stomach all the way down to the lar- to the end of the large bowel. And you can inoculate with a given microbiome from a donor, right? So you can pick any kind of donor you want. Uh, it has a mucosal layer. It has everything. You feed it like a normal digestive system and food processes through it and so on. So it's a really great way of studying what happens to the microbiome when you alter variables. So we took a pristine three-year-old's microbiome, and they might go, well, where is this coming from? We had to find it in some fjord somewhere in in the Scandinavian countries, right? So this was a a child that was vaginal birth, full term, uh, hadn't had any vaccines yet, um, hadn't had a single course of antibiotics yet, was eating natural food from the farm, three-year-old microbiome. We took it out, sampled it, stabilized it basically a pristine microbiome, right? High diversity, high keystone species, beautiful production of short chain fatty acids, all the stuff you wanna see in a healthy microbiome. We inoculated this digestive system with it and we started exposing it with the food to what I would call serial level of of, um, glyphosate, right? What the EPA in the US designates as safe level of exposure. Mm. So we started exposing it. After three weeks of exposure, that pristine microbiome started to look like the microbiome of someone with inflammatory bowel disease. Whoa. Three weeks. Wow. Right? The production of short-chain fatty acids, like butyrate, propane, and acetate, cut almost 50%. The the microbiome started producing what we call branched-chain fatty acids, which are actually toxic. Hmm. Started producing high levels of ammonia, right? Uh, The diversity dropped quite significantly. So all of these changes started occurring in just that three-week period. And so when you start thinking about how profound of a change that can be, and this isn't a control system and so on, but when you translate that to human exposure over years, right, it is a very profound thing that occurs to us. That's insane. And glyphosate is banned in the, in the EU, is it not? It is. So, the, oh, that's a funny part I was going to mention in, uh, is the we were looking for um, – a combination of glyphosate. So we wanted to test the actual active ingredient. And then the final formula that you find in the commercial space, which has like all these adjuncts added to it, right? So what we found actually, interestingly, the glyphosate itself did not cause much change hmm. in the in the microbiome over that three-week period. It was the commercial formula that has all these other acids and other things added to it that created the most profound change. Interesting. And we wanted to test that particular formula, but we couldn't buy it almost anywhere else in the world except the U.S. Hmm. because it's banned everywhere in Europe, right? Wow. So we had to send somebody to a Home Depot in Florida to pick it up and then ship it to London because we couldn't find it anywhere else in Europe because it's completely banned everywhere else. And yet it's the most common used one in, in North America, or why, at least in the U.S. Why do we have such, because you're you're immersed in this industry, right? Mm-hmm. You liaise between Just Thrive and, and I'm sure the FDA and all these regulatory bodies. Mm-hmm. Why, how did it become so lax? Yeah, in this in this country, and and the thing is, it's laxed in certain areas and very stringent in others, mm. right? Um, and I think at the end of the day, and and you know, not to sound like a, a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> but at the end of the day, there's it's really where the economic motivations are, right? Mm. So if you look at the FDA, it's a revolving door between the food and the pharmaceutical companies in terms of who chairs the FDA, who are the decision makers, and all that, right? Um, oftentimes, what happens is the former head of the FDA now has a uh, you know board seat on a new pharma company right. once they retire, right? And it goes back and forth, right? The former board member of this pharmaceutical company is now the head of the FDA. It just goes back and forth, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And so it's a self-serving industry. Mm. Um, it, we saw this with the whole fish oil thing, right? It, you know, there was a prescription fish oil that was, that was approved for treating triglycerides. Yeah. This is high EPA fish oil, right? right? 
And and basically, at the end of the day, because this pharmaceutical company was coming out with a drug version of fish oil, they basically petitioned the FDA and said, okay, this means that any fish oil that meets this characteristic is actually a drug and is an illegal, unapproved drug, and you need to go out there and police this. Whoa. Right? And so then the FDA started fining and sending warning letters and all that to companies who are selling fish oil like they have been for 80 years. Right. Fish oil has been around as a supplement for almost 80 to 100 years. Yes. Yeah, so what were they right? trying to do? They were trying to like what? So they're trying to capture the market. Right. So yeah. they so we know that this high EPA fish oil is beneficial for inflammation. So a pharma drug is coming out as a high EPA fish oil. And they basically want to eliminate the supplement side. They were it. trying to pull fish oil off the market. They were trying to pull fish oil supplements, supplements. off the market. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we're seeing this happening with peptides as well. Uh, A very recent uh, decision has come through that peptides, I think by the end of this month, are going to be illegal. And I know so many doctors, regenerative medicine doctors, hormone doctors who use peptides all the time, right? But we've got more and more peptides coming out as pharmaceutical drugs over the next, you know, Ozempic, of course, has come out, all these GLP-1 agonists. And I think one of the things is going to be to try to control the compounding pharmacy world so that it can service the larger, uh, you know, industry. Yeah. Right. So I think there's just just a lot of economic motivations, um, and you see this in like vitamin studies. There's some like terrible studies that are that'll be done. Like there was a study that came out. I think this is 15 years ago that said basically vitamin E causes cancer. Mm. Right. And you look at it and you go, you look at the study. Anyone that has any scientific background could look at the study and go, this was completely gamed <laughs> to give this this response. Right. The, the type of vitamin E they use, a synthetic version of tocopherols and all this stuff, how the, the patients that they administered it to and all that. It's like, okay. Because there are multiple forms of vitamin E. In any in any natural vitamin E containing food, there is, I, I believe, something like eight isoforms of vitamin E. Yep. So what did they do? They gave like a synthetic, only one version of it when naturally you you would expect to be consuming all eight. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yep. Just one version, very high dosing. Um, and, and often when you do a synthetic, you have these single singular isomers. And some of those isomers may not do anything that the vitamin actually does, but mm. in fact do the opposite and may, may be toxic. Right, so we see this in all these synthetic vitamins and all that. Got it. So this vitamin E study raised sounded alarms about about the safety of vitamin E, yep. which we know is an incredibly you know it's a, it's a really important antioxidant to protect fatty structures in the body. Yep. And so they tried to what they just fear monger the supplement or tried did they try to pull it off the market or what? That's exactly right. So what they do is they'll they'll start using things like that to create fear mm. and create doubt, not only in the minds of consumers, but I think more importantly in the minds of doctors, right? Because where supplements and natural things start to take hold in the natural in the population is when doctors start adapting it, mm. right? When you think about your, your average allopathic doctor, yeah. right? Almost every allopathic doctor now will recommend vitamin D. And they'll say, yeah, I hear it. It's good. And there's yeah. a bunch of studies. You know, let me, I could check your vitamin D level. I have a test from, you know, one of the big lab companies. So they've all adopted to understanding vitamin D to a certain degree. And they'll look at your vitamin D levels. They might even tell you to take a supplement of it. That's when it becomes main mainstream, right? And so the idea is to prevent allopathic mainstream doctors from adopting any of these nutrients. Because that's when it starts to interfere with some of the drugs and things like that that you can sell instead, right? Yeah. And so I think that a lot of those kind of studies are the kinds of studies that will go out there through the medical community. And I'll talk to allopathic doctors, and they'll go, oh, God, don't take that vitamin E. I saw this study. It causes cancer, right? And you're like, it's a vitamin. We've been using it for, you know, since the dawn of man, right? Yeah. And so, um, but I think that's that's where it really has an impact. Mm-hmm. on whether or not these things get adopted largely. Yeah, I remember they were most recently also trying to ban um, NAC, if I recall correctly. They, they have. They yeah. have. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Now, Which is uh, a glutathione precursor. It is. It's such a wonderful compound, right? Mm-hmm. It can do so many good things in your system. Um, but now it's you know banned and you can't use it. Mm-hmm. And, and if you want to get it into a supplement, you have to go to Canada and produce it and under drug license, all kinds of stuff. Crazy. Just, yeah. Okay, so how do we then uh, procure better gut health, right? Yep. We're inundated with toxins. 
um, not to fear monger, uh, but you know, obviously our, our food supply is ultra processed now. 73% yep. of the items in your average supermarket now are ultra processed, full of additives that are not added to improve the nutritional value of these products, but to increase the bottom line. Um, and so, yeah, how do we fight back? Yeah. So, and this is where the idea of gut health should be kind of a lifestyle component for people, right? It's no different than than exercise. Everyone knows, hopefully everyone knows that exercise is beneficial, but you can't just go work out once and be like, I did it, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm done. So uh, it, it has to be part of your lifestyle. So we have to continuously think about our ecosystem, right? We are this beautiful microbial construct, right? We're called a holobiont, which is a super organism. We're a walking, talking rainforest made up of thousands of species that have to work together in order to perpetuate the health of the whole. So if we think of ourselves in terms of an ecosystem, and then we have to look at the choices we make on a regular basis and go, am I doing anything today to protect my ecosystem, right? Because inevitably, you're going to be encountering things that will harm your ecosystem. So we have to actively think about it, right? And I think that's one of the key things I try to put in people's minds is that you have to be really active in your thinking about your ecosystem, right? So, um, so then what are some of the basic things? And as it turns out, some of the most basic things that we've all talked about uh, from a health and wellness perspective are things that also support the microbiome in a very positive way, mm -hmm. right? So what is that? Like a diverse diet, right? Being an omnivore. Humans evolved as an omnivore, right? You can't have these narrow diets. You can't just be like, I'm only eating meat and salt all day long, right? Or I'm only eating plants. We didn't have the luxury of that during human evolution. And so we co-evolve with these species that have learned to utilize a, a significant breadth of, my, of nutrients in order to facilitate all the chemical functions, right? So we have to keep thinking like an omnivore, omnivore, we wanna diversify our diet. There's some studies that show that early humans, our ancestors up, ate upwards of 600 different types of foods annually, Wow! right? They gathered, they hunted, they foraged, they picked things, they cultivated, they did all kinds of stuff, right? The average Westerner I've counted eats about 15, different types of foods, Damn. right? On, a, on an annual basis. Mm. It's just absolutely mind boggling. So then you start to think, well, how are the rest of the microbes being fed, right? Because there's a diversity of microbes because of a diversity of nutrients. And at the end of the day, you see this is one of the reasons why we're losing so many uh, microbes in our system, right? So diversifying our diet is one of the simplest things you can do. Um, one of the ways I recommend people doing it is I always say, Go to the ethnic grocery store in your area, right? Uh, uh, an Asian market or a Middle Eastern market, you'll find roots and tubers and meats and things that you don't find at your regular grocery store. Add one of them into your uh, diet each week. Hmm. You don't have to make a whole meal of it, you know, if you're eating a stir fry of some sort or bake something. Just add a little bit of one of those new things into your diet and try to maintain that the next week. So by the end of the year, you would have added 30 or so new foods. And that will make a profound effect on your microbiome, on the diversity. Love it. Right? You're protecting your ecosystem. Uh, number two is reducing the things that we know harm the ecosystem, like we talked about, processed foods, right? Trying to eliminate as many processed foods as you can, going to the organic foods as much as you can to reduce herbicides and pesticides. What's ideal is if you grow some of your own produce, right? There was a while where I was really trying to start a gardening initiative, right? If people just grew like, let's say, carrots and cucumbers and, and tomatoes, right? And you consume those and you didn't consume those from the grocery store, right? It would make a huge economic shift in that whole um in that in that system where we're not producing all of these produce that that are covered and laced with pesticides and herbicides which 60 70 percent of it gets thrown out anyway right most of this produce doesn't get consumed within a certain amount of time it gets thrown out and so growing some of it in natural good soil in your own home eating it directly out of your own garden, right? It can be a little box garden in your window. It doesn't have to be something big outside. Have you seen these vertical lettuce growers? I yeah. forget what they're called, but there's like a company now that makes these vertical yeah. uh, contraptions that you can you can grow lettuce in. My friend Kristen does this. Yeah, yeah, they're kind of like somewhat, somewhat hydroponic-like systems, yeah. right? Yeah, um, th those are fantastic. I think if you can grow anything in your home and and consume it that's a good thing hmm. right you're you're moving towards kind of that slower food um you know more localized food yeah uh near my house there are great co-ops that you can belong to 
farmers co-ops, right? Where you can get meat, produce, and all that directly from the farm. Uh, you get things that are only in season, which is fantastic. It's not much. It's something like, you know, 100 bucks or 200 bucks a month or something like that. And you get a staple of things that come through. Whatever's fresh, whatever's grown at that time, uh, people should start belonging to those because now you're supporting a local economy, you're getting fresher food, slower food, things that aren't been processed and stored, right? So so moving yourself towards less exposure to things that are gonna harm your microbiome. And then the first thing we talked about was diversifying your diet, hmm. right? Then the third thing would be getting outside, right? And, and being deliberate about it. I tell people, prescribe yourself time outside in a natural environment like you would a drug, hmm. right? 30 minutes, three times a week, no negotiations, right? And not just going up and down your, your street, but try to get to a natural environment. Go for a hike, you know, and near LA, go to a hike up the Hollywood sign or something like that, yeah, right? And yeah. dirt, natural dirt. But then here's how you enhance that experience. Eat outside, right? So this is the most natural thing we do with the environment is mm. eating in the natural environment, right? So I say, take something with you, a fruit or a snack or whatever it is that you like, right? Something healthy, ho hopefully. And then go for a hike and be deliberate, be like a kid and like pick up stuff, pick up rocks, pick up sticks, touch the texture of that tree bark and be like, whoa, that's so weird, right? Pick up leaves and look at them, right? We do this naturally, as especially as kids. Yeah. But that's us interacting with the environment in a very important way. And then sit down when you get somewhere, take the food out, don't sanitize your hands for God's sake, and then eat. Hmm. That's one of the most natural ways of enhancing the diversity of your microbiome. So many people today are obsessed with hygiene, particularly in the wake of the pandemic. Totally, yes. Right, like there's oh a, there was this like hygiene theater thing that happened and became seemingly commonplace. And, uh, but just in general, there are a lot of like germaphobes out there. Absolutely. And I yeah. think that's like what you're saying. It sounds like that's probably to the detriment of their health. It is. Yeah. There's, there's a great book that was published by Martin Blazer, who's a, uh, one of the top microbiome researchers out of NYU called The Missing Microbe. Mm. And it, it focuses a lot on our hygiene hypothesis issue of, you know, overuse of antibiotics, cleaners, all these things, right? So, in, like in my home, for example, we don't sterilize most surfaces, right? Most surfaces are clean with a bottle of spray water, maybe a couple drops of essential oils for smell, and, and you just wipe it down, mm -hmm. right? We want to create a diverse ecosystem in the household. Uh, we want to have the windows open as much as we can, right? We want to have a dog in the house or an animal that goes outside and comes back in. What about a cat? Uh, you know, cat, especially if the cat goes outside and comes back in, mm. or if you walk your cat. <laughs> Some I've people tried. do that. Yeah. <laughs> Cats are a little finicky. She's not into it. Uh, she's not into the walking. <laughs> no. Yeah, um, but any animal mm. uh, adds to the diversity of the microbiome in the household, right? So, so yeah, absolutely, we need to engage more with microbes in the natural setting we have this constant osmosis between the environment and ourselves with microbes we shed almost as many microbes as we pick up in the environment right and then within households we also influence each other's microbiomes significantly right there was a wonderful study and this speaks to like the your exposure level to dysfunctional uh, things and dysfunctional bacteria. There was a fascinating study that, that was run by Johns Hopkins University um, where they took individuals at the hospital that were given a course of antibiotics for whatever reason. And then before they started the course of antibiotics, they took a bunch of microbiome samples and then they, they looked at and created a fingerprint of their microbiome. Then they followed them through the course of the antibiotics and then up to six months after. No surprise, they found that the, the antibiotic created a... a, a dysfunction in the microbiome, and that dysfunction was observed up to six months later after stopping the antibiotic. But the surprising thing of this study is they also followed the microbiomes of household inhabitants of that individual hmm. who are not on the antibiotic, and they saw the similar type of dysfunction in those people. Whoa. Right? So living with somebody, and it didn't have to be a, a, a romantic partner. You didn't have to sleep with them. It was even roommates and siblings and all that, right? Living with somebody who was on a course of antibiotics and their microbiome is getting disrupted, your microbiome gets disrupted in a similar way. Wow. Right? So we have this microbiome cloud around us all the time. And the people we surround ourselves with also provide input to that cloud. And so if you're living in an environment where you're really health conscious and you're trying your best, right, trying to make, make the right decisions, but you have a roommate that really doesn't care and is doing all these things that are harming their microbiome, they will have a negative effect on you, right? So that's one of the ways in which you start to extract yourself out of those 
negative in microbiome environments. It's fascinating. Right? It's like when women li- you know, live together in college and their totally. periods sync up. Yep. It's like you live together no matter what gender you are and yeah. like your, your microbiome syncs with those who you're co- cohabitating with. Totally. And, and this may be also part of you know, that, that whole idea of like if you surround yourself with the people that you want to be like, right? The idea that you, the company you keep is really important in terms of your ascension, your success, and your attitude and things like that. A lot of that is about sharing microbes. Mm. Right. There are microbes that increase your um, altruism, that make you more friendly, make you more outgoing. And the reason they do that is because they want to jump from host to host. So they make you go and hug people. They make you interact with people more closely. Right. So so think about your environment. Right. So think about who's in your household. Think about what their health is like. And, and this is why it becomes important to advocate for other people's health as well. Right. Because you're microbiome is really your home, your your office, your environments that you're in all the time. Mm. Um, so then an, another thing and a very, very important thing for a healthy microbiome is stress management, right? Stress is one of the biggest um, drivers of dysfunction in the microbiome. So there's lots of studies now coming out showing that small bouts of stress create enough change in the microbiome where over time, each individual bout of stress adds up to like taking a a couple courses of antibiotics. Wow. It's it's immense, right? And just think about the people driving in traffic to work every day and the frustration they're feeling, they get cut off and they're, or they read an email or a tweet or they jumped on social media right right when they woke up and they're seeing things that are irritating them, right? All that anxiety, all that stress creates significant dysbiosis and the dysbiosis makes it easier for you to get stressed and anxious, mm. right? So it's a self-perpetuating cycle. Yeah. Right. So we the stress that. that you experience mentally can impact the gut microbiome, but uh, concurrently, the uh, a dysfunctional gut microbiome can make you feel stressed out? Yes. So um, here's how this works, right? So there are lots of opportunistic organisms that live in your system, and that's perfectly normal, right? And they're opportunistic in that given the right opportunity, they'll become pathogenic or they'll express their virulence factors. Not in the right opportunity, they just kind of hang out. They help in some cases. In fact, they do some metabolic processes and so on. What many of these organisms have learned is that when the host stress hormone levels are high, that that's their quote-unquote opportunity to express their virulence factors. Interesting. Right? So this, this is what they're waiting for, right? This is why people, for example, they get cold sores. They often, the cold sore will pop up when they're under stress right? People, they get acne. They can get acne under stress when mm-hmm. they're under stress conditions. We always say, well, we get sick when we're in stre- when we're stressed out, right? Like if you had a hard week and you haven't slept well and you get in, it was a stressful week, the chances of getting sick are much higher, yeah. right? All of that is because viruses, bacteria, and so on know to enhance your virulence factor expression when your stress hormones are high. They're opportunistic. Right? They're opportunistic. They're bastards. This is a great opportunity, right? They've learned this over millions of years because what happens when you're under stress is that the, the host goes into a flight or fight response when you're under stress, right? When you're in the flight or fight response, you're not in the parasympathetic nervous system, which means you're not resting, digesting, recuperating, recuperating, rebuilding, and so on, right? You're not doing any of those things. And what you're doing is is selectively increasing inflammation to the brain, the heart, and the muscles. Mm. Because your body's trying to get you ready to fight or flee from the situation, right? And your body uses your immune system to get blood to those regions. So it turns on immune cells in the brain, in the central nervous system, in the heart, and other muscles to bring inflammation to those regions. That's how you get blood to those regions, right? Because inflammation is not a bad thing, right? Inflammation, what you're saying, is is just basically sending like immune soldiers exactly to the to where they're going to likely be most needed exactly that's why time that's why if you get cut it's going to get red right the red around the cut is the inflammation your immune system is recruiting cells and immune factors to that region number one to protect that region to quarantine it so things don't get in and number two to start triggering the rebuilding process Mm. right expression of ace2 receptors and so on that start rebuilding the tissue so in this case what the immune system has done is that when the body goes into flight or fight response, it goes, okay, we don't have the capability of resting, digesting, repairing, and all that. We need to shut that down. What we need to do is focus on getting blood to the areas which are needed, like the brain, so you can increase visual acuity, auditory acuity, your cognitive system is functioning really acutely so that you can sense danger appropriately and all that to your heart so that your heart can pump and increase your respiratory and heart rate to your muscles so you your muscles are perfused so you can fight right 
but that's a very unhealthy state to be in for long, prolonged periods of time, right? In a single fight or flight response, it's fine because it can likely save your life, right? If you're if there's a true danger. But what's happening today is that people are in this state half the day, 70% of the day, 80% of the day, and so on. Hmm. And that has everything to do with what's happening in the gut, right? So going back to how stress causes this problem, right? So stress is increasing stress hormone response. Then there are microbes that read that and go, hey, this is our opportunity. Let's increase our virulence factors. Well, also, and correct me if I'm wrong, blood leaves the GI tract, right? So it's like when the cat's away, the mice will play. So the immune system is basically like MIA, right? From the largest interface that it has with the external environment, which is your gut. Yep. Because it's, again, it's in your muscles, it's in your brain, it's in your heart to get you away from the, the potential source of danger. And so you've got all these opportunistic bacteria down there that are like essentially given a hall pass. Totally. And they're like, this is the perfect time. The immune system's not active here. The immune system, the part of the active immune system is the inflammatory, which is the innate immune response, which is nonspecific anyway. So it's not going to be targeting the pathogen specifically. So it's like, okay, this is the right opportunity to turn on our virulence factor. So while the body's going through that stress and there's all this distraction for the immune system, these pathogenic microbes are increasing their numbers Hmm. and then competing against the beneficial microbes that normally keep things in check, right? So now, if you think about that, this fight or fight, this fight or flight state is the better state for these opportunists, right? So not only have they designed the capability of reading the flight or fight response and the stress state, and then they turn on the virulence factors, many of them have also created molecules that put you back in the flight or fight state so that you maintain that condition that they prefer. Yikes. Right? So if you think about like Campylobacter jejuni, which is a, a gut pathogen, one of the effects of a Campylobacter infection is that you get panic all of a sudden. Right? You get you can develop a panic disorder from this bacteria, right? Whoa. It's sending stuff up your your uh, vagus nerve to your brain to your n- central nervous system creating panic responses, right? These microbes will also attenuate the production of things like serotonin and dopamine in the gut, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, GABA, right? So it interferes with tryptophan metabolism. So you can't make melatonin and serotonin. All of these things that take us out of the balanced state and keep us in the stress flight or fight state Mm. because it works well for them, right? So, So multiple bouts of stress ongoing basically creates an environmental selection for the types of microbes that do well in that environment. And then it's it's their benefit to maintain you in that environment, right? Wow. So being stressed increases their growth. When they increase their growth, they put you back in the stress state because that's the state they want you in. Hmm. This is where the gut-brain connection comes in really in, in significantly, right? Because these gut microbes have a very profound way of keeping your brain in a sympathetic fight or flight state, Hmm. right? Um, Now, one of the key components of the flight or fight response is the release of cortisol, right? Cortisol is a very important compound for us. It it shuttles us through the flight or fight response. It actually increases blood pressure. Uh, It increases perfusion and does all these things to get us ready to fight or flee. But then cortisol is also its own off switch, right? So as cortisol increases, part of it dumps into the gut because there are microbes in the gut that metabolize cortisol and then send the metabolic byproducts to the kidneys where it opens up sodium and potassium pumps and puts more liquid into the system, right? That increases blood pressure. This is why chronic stress creates hypertension, Mm -hmm. right? And so what happens with cortisol when it goes into the gut besides being metabolized is that if you are missing certain microbial components, cortisol creates profound leaky gut almost instantly, right? All those tight junction proteins that we talked about, the shoulder-to-shoulder sitting cells, all those start to open up, inflammation increases, and you get a tremendous amount of toxin translocation in a very short amount of time. Right? With, a, with a stressful stimulus. With a stressful stimulus. This is with an outside stimulus, right? right. So let's say you're driving to work. Your gut is, is like an average person's gut, which means it's messed up to some degree. Someone cuts you off, right? You feel that kind of stress boiling in. Cortisol is going up, that means. Now, uh, within... 15 minutes or so that cortisol is going to start dumping into the gut, which means it's going to profoundly create leaky gut. That means one uh, cytokine called IL-6 is going to go up, right? The problem with IL-6 going up 
in this response is that IL-6 will make its way back up to the brain and re-trigger your HPA axis as if you're experiencing another stressor, hmm. right? So then that releases more cortisol, which goes back to the gut, makes your gut even more leaky, more IL-6 goes up, re-triggers your HPA axis again. So a single stressor in the morning can keep you in this flight, fight or flight state throughout the entire day. Yikes. And makes your gut leakier and leakier and leakier. This is why our bowels become loose. We we feel pain in the stomach. This is why we've always talked about our gut feeling about things, right? We always associate the gut with emotions hmm. for this reason because cortisol and its ability to make the gut profoundly leaky and re-trigger the fight or flight response is a very real component of modern living. So what happens is we can experience stress now, but we can't come down from it because the on switch is cons consistently on and the microbial off switch, which is supposed to be in the gut, which is a psychobiotics, they are not present. And so it's very hard to turn it off. Hmm. Wow, that is crazy. Yeah, and, and that can create symptoms like diarrhea. Also, mm -hmm. when you're getting partially digested, you know, food material that haven't been fully broken down in the small intestine, you know, coming into the large intestine that can create gas and things getting fermented that shouldn't otherwise get fermented right at that point. Totally. So if you, if you look at the neurological system, you've got the enteric nervous system, which is a neurological system of the bowel, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's the second most dense neurological endings uh, in your body, more dense than your own spinal cord, right? Whoa. And then that's connected to your brain, the central nervous system through the vagus nerve. So all of this neurological activation of the flight or fight response and so on and inflammation, if you will, starts in the enteric nervous system and then moves up the enteric nervous system to the central nervous system. So you actually feel the effects of anxiety first in the bowel, hmm. right? Because your your enteric nervous system is now inflamed and, and compromised. And this is why IBS is no longer thought to be a primary gut issue, it's a gut brain issue. Wow. Because IBS is a overactive, hyperactive, hypervigilant enteric nervous system. And it's paired with the brain and so when the, when the gut uh, enteric nervous system, the neurological system in the gut is overactive, it's often sending signals up to the brain and causing the brain to be hyperactive as well, right? This is one of the roles of GABA, for example. GABA calms the neurological system. This is why GABA, this is why benzodiazepines and all are used as anti-anxiolytes because they enhance the effect of GABA, mm. which calms the nervous system down, right? Puts you back into low frequency brain waves and all those things. It's not a great way of doing it. There's more natural ways of doing it. But nonetheless, what's happening is your enteric nervous system is hyperactive through neurological activation from dysfunctional microbes, through cortisol, through IL-6 and all that. And then that's moving up the central nervous system so your brain is hyperactive and now you're anxious and your bowels are loose. This is why upwards of 70% of people with IBS also have confirmed mood disorders, right? And you compare that to age match cohorts, of non-IBS people, it's less than 18 or 19%. Wow. Right? So you're almost four times more likely to have anxiety and depression if you have IBS, and you're almost four times more likely to have IBS if you have anxiety and depression. Damn. They go together. Wow. Right? Hand in hand. So when it comes to treating, self-treating, right? Obviously, people should should consult with their, their healthcare practitioners, but you... Uh, at Just Thrive, and we kind of talked about this a little bit the last time you were on the show, but this whole new world that we're just now starting to scratch the surface of and explore of psychobiotics. Yeah. So these are like probiotics that you can take that actually seed your large intestine with beneficial bacteria that can help potentially break that this cycle of fight or flight, gut dysbiosis, fight or flight, gut dysbiosis. Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, in order for something to be a psychobiotic, it has to be clinically determined that it has a profound effect on the central nervous system uh, through the gut, right? So it's a gut bacteria that has an effect on the central nervous mm. system. Um, the, the term psychobiotic is coined by a integrative um, psychiatrist named Ted Dynan, who works at uh, University College Cork and the largest microbiome institute called APC. We've had the privilege of working with them in the APC. I've worked with those researchers for years now. Uh, and, it's, and it's been absolutely amazing because they, they invented this term and discovered this idea of psychobiotics. 
So uh, this example of, of a psychobiotic called Bifero Longum 1714, it's so profound and elegant from a biological standpoint, mm. right? You can't engineer this kind of stuff. So they basically were looking at individuals that um, were well-balanced mood, slept really well compared to age match individuals that had really uh, significant amount of mood dysfunctions, didn't sleep well, and so on. They started sampling the microbiomes uh, in Ireland and to, to look at what is the significant difference between these two groups of individuals. The ones that had really well-balanced moods, slept well, and so on, had high levels of a type of bacteria that has these carbohydrate structures on it called peptidoglycan and exopolysaccharide. That's what they named it, right? When you look at it under an electron micrograph, you basically see all these tentacles around the bacteria, and then within its cell membrane, it has these peptidoglycan carbohydrates. Mm. Right, So then they were like, oh, okay, so these individuals have this bacteria that has this unique feature. These individuals who have stress and anxiety and, and sleep disorders have none of these bacteria, right? So let's figure out and look at these bacteria. So they started looking at the bacteria. First thing they did was identify the gene that produced all these carbohydrates. And as it turns out, it's a single gene in this bacteria, right? So then they knock out that gene and they create a version of the bacteria that doesn't produce the carbohydrates and they test it doesn't do any of the things that the psychobiotic normally does, right? So now they know it's just this one gene and these carbohydrates that are doing all of this psychobiotic-like effect. So what is it? What's happening, right? So what happens in this case, and this is where it becomes absolutely fascinating, you consume this microbe, right? It goes into your small bowel, and as it's moving through the small bowel, it enters an area of the small bowel called the Peyer's patches, right? This is like the terminal end of the small bowel before it goes into the large bowel. What's cool about the Peyer's patches is lots of immune sampling tissue there. And your immune cells called dendritic cells can sit there and reach across the membrane and sample microbes that are in the area to try to figure out what's there, Whoa. right? Constantly, they've got these tentacles that reach across the lining of the gut. Now, they reach across, and when they come in contact with these microbes, particularly because of its carbohydrate structure, what the dendritic cells do is they swallow these microbes. Hmm. And they bring it across the, mem the lining of the gut, and they bring it into circulation. Now, here's what dendritic cells normally do when they swallow things. They're called phagocytic cells because they swallow things, right? They normally swallow things that are bad for you, like viruses, bacteria, toxins. They digest it, and then they, pre they present a component of that thing to the rest of the immune system to go, hey, I found this thing, T cells, B cells, I need you to start attacking this thing, right, wherever you see it. So they're called antigen-presenting cells. But in the case that they swallow these psychobiotics, they don't present any antigens. They know that they don't want to activate the immune system. Mm. Instead, what they do is they digest the bacteria on the inside of the dendritic cells, and they spit out all the carbohydrates into circulation. These carbohydrates go to the neurological system and attenuate all the inflammatory responses that cortisol, opportunistic bacteria, and stress creates. Whoa. Completely attenuates the inflammatory responses, right? To the point, where these carbohydrates actually change brainwave function, right? So we know that the brain has low and high frequency brainwaves, right? High frequency brainwaves are really good when you're like focused on work and trying to do diligent things and all that. You're trying to be highly productive. But when you encounter a stressor, if you remain in the high frequency brainwave, you're gonna blow up the impact of the stressor, right? Mm -hmm. This is what gets people spiraling out of control and so on. What you need to be able to do, your brain needs to be able to tap into low frequency brainwaves like theta waves when you experience a stressor. From a practice standpoint, the way you achieve that is through years of meditation. Right. right? That's the biggest benefit of meditation is the ability to tap into low frequency brain waves, right? Those are the individuals that tend to be very chill in the in the in in confronting stress, yeah. right? You see that. You can tell. You can see some people are panicked and worked up and some people are just kind of chill, yeah. right? Their brain goes into coping mechanisms, deals with the stressor, no problem. So you could do years and years of meditation and try to achieve that, right? I ain't got time for that. And we don't have time. And we don't <laughs> have the capability. I've tried that. I'm so bad at meditation, right? Um, the psychobiotic in, a, in, in three published studies in 30 days completely changes your brainwave activity to low frequency theta waves when you encounter a stressor. Whoa. So this is a bacteria that we've outsourced this capability to, right? We've outsourced the capability to tap into the right brainwave frequency when we experience a stressor, so the stressor is not so profound, 
and and we've outsourced that capability to the bacteria, hmm. right? So this is how profound a psychobiotic can be. It stops cortisol from making your gut leaky, so it doesn't ele elevate IL-6, it doesn't reactivate the HPA axis, it reduces the inflammation in the brain, it allows the off switch of the of uh, the whole stress response, which is called glucocorticoid receptors, to be expressed, so that you can go through a flight or fight response and then come off of it and go back to normal functioning and it changes brainwave frequency, right? Uh, all the while, it's also reducing inflammation and hyperactivity in the enteric nervous system, as well as central nervous system. So it's one of the most well-studied strains for IBS wow. as well at the same time. And there are like randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials that, have, that, that support this? Yeah, there's 80 or so on the IBS side of it and about 10 on the mood, anxiety, sleep side of it. And all done by the APC, which is the good part about it, right? So we, we get the privilege of working with these researchers. Yeah. Their studies are funded by grants. They get con all the grants. And then we have the ability to license these strains and work mm. with them that way. Um, so that it's not our own research. It's their research. And these are all published in Nature and all the best, you know, JAMA, all the best journals that you can think of. Now, if somebody were to get to pick up uh, a bottle of, is it, is the, is it the Just Calm It product? is. It's Just Calm, yeah. Yeah. Like, how long does one need to be on that before they see a, a change yeah. in their mood? So nor you know, under normal circumstances, if you're somebody that throughout the day experiences stress in what you would consider an unhealthy way, right? Meaning that stress affects your quality of life, yeah. right? Um, it's not people that see something, get stressed, and then feel fine. 10 minutes later. Yeah. It's people that it impacts the quality of life. Those individuals will feel a difference in how they perceive stress in about two, through, two to three weeks, hmm. right? Because you're you're attenuating the inflammatory processes and the, the reactivation cycle that occurs in people without these psychobiotics naturally. Um, and, and here's the crazy thing. They found through the screening process that less than eight or 10% of the population that they tested had these psychobiotics in their gut, mm. right? We're losing these microbes in a profound way. This actually also ties to uh, neurological development disorders like ADD, ADHD, and all that. I'll, I'll, I'll explain why in a second. And then I also do want to explain my earlier claim of how stress and anxiety is the precursor to Alzheimer's, dementia, and so on. Yeah. Right? Because, and, and let me connect the two. The first one is the, the the neurological development disorders. So these carbohydrates that we talked about that are so important for managing inflammation in the brain. As it turns out, those carbohydrates are also the key trigger to the neurological development of the brain in utero. So mom's gut bacteria is constantly reaching across her lining looking for these microbes to bring to the placenta, digest the microbes, and release the carbohydrates into the placenta, hmm. right? One particular carbohydrate called peptidoglycan. These are bacterial peptidoglycan. The baby's, the placenta has receptors and carriers for bacterial peptidoglycan, so they bind it, they take it to the baby's brain. The baby's brain has receptors for bacterial peptidoglycan. When it binds it, it triggers the formation of the blood-brain barrier. It triggers synaptogenesis, which is making of the synaptic neurons. It triggers differentiation of the different parts of the brain tissue. And it also um, triggers the, the, the formation of that the corpus callosum, right? So arguably, some of the most important things we want to happen to the human brain in utero we've outsourced to bacteria Crazy. to help us do that, right? Wild. So if you think about mom that's stressed, that has high anxiety. So when you look at the risk for delivering babies that are on the spectrum who have attention deficit disorder and so on, one of the key risk factors are people that have gestational stress and gestational obesity, right? Gestational stress and gestational obesity go hand in hand. They are both associated with having low levels of these functioning psychobiotics, mm. which means that mom doesn't have enough of these microbes to expose those peptidoglycans to the developing baby. So the baby's neurological system is going to be underdeveloped. This is why anxiety and stress and mood disorders continue to rise in prevalence, as well as babies that are born with neurological dysfunctions, right? They're the same system. Now, my, my other claim about the Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's and, and dementia issue. Well, just to pause you, I mean, this is like just for people who are kind of shocked that we might have from birth such a 
as you illustrated, such a symbiotic relationship with these microbes, human breast milk has what are called in it human milk oligosaccharides, right? Mm -hmm. So HMOs that are literally these carbohydrates in breast milk, naturally derived carbohydrates in breast milk that are specifically there to feed the gut bacteria of the neonate. Yep, that's right. right? And in fact, um, you know, think about breast milk is the only mammalian food that's been perfected by evolution, hmm. right? Over millions of years. It's our first food. We have about 200 different oligosaccharides in breast milk. It's one of the most complex structures that you can think of from a, from a nutrient perspective, right? You can't mimic that in a lab. Uh, and then on top of that, it makes up about 30% of the solids and the baby can't digest it for energy. It's mm. all there just for the microbes, right? Uh, and then, of course, breast milk also can contain upwards of 600 different microbes. Yeah, right? like mammary tissue is not sterile. Right, exactly. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And so when you think about, you know, uh, the mom not having enough of these types of bacteria in her gut to expose it to the baby during development, and then you think about... 33% or so of births are C-section, so they're not even passing through yeah. the vaginal canal where you get a lot of the inoculum. And then a significant number of people don't breastfeed till term, hmm. right? And and that's because a lot of it is because they've been programmed to think that formula is just as good, if not better, because oh. it has DHA and it's fortified with this and fortified with that, right? So we're, we're, we're stepping away from all the natural things, uh, the interaction with the ecosystem and the environment, and that is costing us in our development because mm. we've outsourced a lot of the development to microbes. And if we divorce ourselves from the microbes, we absolutely compromise our development. Right? And there's a huge body of research on, I mean, other, even other st strains that are associated with autism spectrum disorder, right? Like, That's right. if I recall correctly in my first book, I wrote about, I don't recall if it was rudieri or rhamnosis, but one of these that's associated, it used to be in much higher concentration in human breast milk, and yep. now it's like you can barely find it. Yeah, so rudieri is definitely one of those that's like missing uh, from our population, mm. right? Uh, in fact, we, we've been working with uh, a researcher named Jens Walter, who's spent a lot of time with the Papua New Guinea tribes. And one of the things he's finding is that in those individuals, one of the highest concentrations of microbes that they have in their gut is ruteri. And ruteri has a lot of implications around oxytocin, the love hormone, on, on creating bonding and creating a village-like atmosphere and so on, right? Because when you think about survival of the human race, um, it was done so through uh, forming of, of groups, intimate groups, right? An individual, a human individual by themselves could not survive in the wilderness, mm. right? The formation of villages and communities is what really allowed us to survive. And ruteri was the principal organism that facilitated that, right? And so uh, a, um, a hunter-gatherer tribe like the Papua New Guinea tribe, is going to care as much about their neighbor and the hut next to them as the people that are living in their hut because they have this bonding microbe and they have very high levels of oxytocin, right? It also manages stress because, of course, one of the things you can't have in the wilderness is elevated amount of stress all the time because, number one, that's going to distract you from the things that are actually going to kill you. Yeah. And number two, you're going to be wholly unhealthy and get infections all the time. Your immune system is not going to work, right. right? So you've got this beautiful organism, Ruteri, that increases your bonding and love hormone, and it reduces cortisol and the stress hormones, right? And in the modern world, you can find almost no Ruteri in people. Hmm. And, it, and, it, and it's gone. And our oxytocin levels are you know, empathy for one another, all that is reduced quite a bit, right? Like people don't care about their neighbors. They're like, screw them. Yeah. I watch out for myself, you know? And so like that whole idea of loss of community structure is probably driven by this missing microbe. And there's an interesting connection, right? Between like the, the, the downstream consequences of that loss of ruteri and the symptoms that you see in ASD, right? Yep, absolutely true. Um, because anything that impacts emotions, hormones, the brain also impacts central nervous system, yeah. right? And the development of the brain. Wow. Um, so yes, not getting exposure to these microbes has a huge implication on emotional development Crazy. in the brain, right? Um, and then the last part about the dementia part, right? So um, when we're undergoing stress, our brain is inflamed. In fact, our gut's becoming leaky. You've got endotoxins leaking through, making its way to the brain, right? Interrupting with serotonin, dopamine function and all that, and your brain's undergoing inflammatory damage. Now, what happens if you're healthy and you've got a healthy gut, you've got good levels of psychobiotics, is you can go through bouts of stress throughout the day, but when you go to sleep, your, your gut starts producing something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which goes in and repairs all the inflammatory damage that occurred to your brain 
that day so that you wake up the next morning with the same brain you started with, right? Now, if your gut is dysfunctional and you go through unusual amounts of stress, you also don't produce enough BDNF. That means when you go to bed, you don't repair all the damage that has occurred. The next day you wake up with a brain that's slightly more damaged than the previous day, Oof. right? And imagine years of this, you start to get all the types of damage that you start to see in dementia, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. And in fact, now there's been a number of landmark studies that show that in Alzheimer's, for example, one of the key factors is the leaking in of LPS, gut-derived LPS, finding its way into perinuclear regions of the Alzheimer's brain and initiating inflammatory damage. Mm. Same thing happens in Parkinson's, in the, in the enteric nervous system, then the central nervous system, dementia, and so on. So what we're experiencing right now is anxiety. Know that your brain is inflamed. Know that your heart's inflamed. You're not digesting. You're not repairing your tissues. And if you stay in that state throughout most of the day, you're in arguably one of the most toxigenic, dis, um, dysfunctional states you can be in for most of the day. And if you don't sleep well that night, which you likely won't because you've got this sympathetic parasympathetic imbalance, you can't repair any of that damage that occurred. Wow. Right. So the next day you're going to wake up with a body that is more damaged, more dysfunctional than it was the day before. Right. And that adds up quickly over time. Yeah, I mean, all the focus has been primarily centered around this uh, amyloid beta plaque with regard to Alzheimer's disease specifically, right? But they've been they've shown at, in Harvard at Harvard that this pro, this this protein aggregates for a reason, usually due to some kind of inflammatory assault, right? So the big exactly looming right. question in the field of Alzheimer's disease is what is causing this plaque to aggregate to such to such a high degree, right? Yep. In as what is has been observed since 1906 in end-stage Alzheimer's disease. It could be inflammation wrought by this excessive gut leakiness, right? That's exactly right. So uh, in 2017, there was a publication that showed that in the Alzheimer's brain, they were finding high concentrations of gut-derived endotoxins, which were starting the inflammatory process that occurred in the brain wow. that eventually leads to the accumulation of these amyloid beta plaques, a protein, right? A protein accumulates if there's tissue damage. They're seeing the same thing in Parkinson's now. It's a different protein. It's called alpha-synuclein, but the same exact process. Gut-derived endotoxins leaking through, accumulating in these tissues, driving inflammatory damage. Over time, that leads to the accumulation of these proteins. And so the proteins became the target, but that's not really the root cause, mm. right? The proteins are a consequence of inflammatory damage. And the inflammatory damage that causes eventual accumulation of the proteins is the same inflammatory damage that's causing anxiety and depression, mm. right? So, so what we experience as anxiety and depression is the kind of damage that's going to lead to a net damage on the brain that, that can possibly trigger Alzheimer's dementia and so on, Damn. right? This is another reason why those conditions are increasing at the same prevalence rate as anxiety, depression, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's are going up at the same rate, and neurological defects in birth is going up at the same rate, right? Our, our brain and our gut are two parts of the same system. They're not two separate systems that are intimately connected. They're two parts of the same exact system. They actually derive from the same polar region of the embryo. They derive from the same tissue. They derive at the same time. And then the microbes are our biggest friend or our biggest foe. Right, And that's one of the things I, I try to explain to people is that when you think about your microbiome, it, you, there's two ends of the spectrum. One end of the spectrum, your microbiome is the most protective, supportive thing of your brain. Right, It's producing all the compounds your brain needs, assimilating the nutrients, uh, protecting the brain with the immune system, reducing inflammation, doing all these wonderful things. Your brain is functioning well. On the other end, if your microbiome is really significantly damaged, not only is it not doing all those protective things, it's actually specifically toxic to the brain because mm. it's producing compounds and inflammation and all that that is toxigenic to the brain. So you've got this friend or foe relationship with your microbes, right? If it's not supporting you, there's a good chance it's actually driving disease in your system. So you have to be uber conscious about this spectrum and where you are with it and things like bloating, to bring it back to the beginning, right? Food intolerances, skin disorders like, oh, I eat this and I get acne or I have eczema, I get these dry patches. All of these things are like the early stage canary in the coal mines that are saying you've got dysfunctions in the lining of your gut, in the immune system, in the mucosa, in the relationship between your microbiome and your immune system that is showing up as this. 
right now is showing up as bloating, it's showing up as food intolerances, as allergies, but will likely transition to much more serious things down the road, hmm. right? When it comes to, we've talked about psychobiotics, but probiotics in general, one of, back when I was doing my research for my first book, uh, I remember seeing data from the Stanford Sonnenberg lab that probiotics, one of the pr proposed mechanisms by which probiotics may actually help reduce inflammation is by helping to seal up a leaky gut. Yep. Do we still think that that's yeah. you know, true? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, those tight junctions yeah. that, that, that we talked about, there are about 40 proteins in the tight junction. They're like this complex lace-like structure. In order to increase the expression of those tight junction proteins, you actually need microbes to stimulate that, hmm. right? So some probiotics can actually do that, uh, can upregulate tight junction proteins. The other part is rebuilding that mucosa layer. Now, in order to rebuild that mucosa layer, you need to, number one, compete against the microbes that are consuming the mucosa layer, mucosa layer without rebuilding it, right? So you need competitive exclusion of those microbes. You need but some to of those microbes that. are beneficial as well, right? Like um, people have been talking lately about acromancia, yeah. mucinophilia, right? Yeah. Mucinophilia meaning that it like consumes. It loves mucin. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, those are one of those microbes that rebuild the mucosa, mucosa layer. So acromancia is one of those that through its consumption triggers the rebuilding of it, mm. right? So that um, fecalum bacteria is another one of those kind of microbes. Um, but there are lots of microbes that will eat the mucin layer without triggering the rebuilding aspect. Got it. So those have to be competed against and reduced. And then you need to increase acromancia, fecalum bacteria. You also need to increase short chain fatty acids, right? So on uh, the Just Thrive, the spore probiotic, we, we published a study in 2017 uh, showing that in 30 days of taking a spore-based probiotic, we can dramatically reduce leaky gut by over 60%. Wow. By doing nothing else but just taking the probiotic by increasing tight junction proteins, increasing short chain fatty acid production, increasing mucosal growth, and reducing inflammatory response in the lining of the gut. Right, so we do all of those things. So you can absolutely reduce leaky gut, but it, but it takes very specific types of strains to be able to do that. One of the things I always caution people against are what I call these kind of kitchen sink probiotics. Right, these companies throw together fifteen species, and you know, and then they they have a lot of fancy marketing and things like that to talk about you know the the sustainability, this, that, and the other. But that's kind of like you know, uh, distracting away from the fact that there's no studies on this combination of 15 strains yeah. to see what it actually does in the system. Because we know, and I talked a lot about the psychobiotics, we know that if you combine the psychobiotic, the bifidolongum 1714, with another bifidobacter, it completely knocks out the effect. Interesting. We've done those studies, right? Wow. APC's done that study. So you you take you take it and you go, oh my God, this is a wonderful psychobiotic. We had companies that are like, hey, we want to buy this psychobiotic. Well, how do you want to use it? Well, we want to throw it in our probiotic <laughs> that has 17 strains. We're like, no, it's not going to work. Right. right. So you can't just take probiotics indiscriminately. You cannot. How no. do people then read probiotic labels? Yeah. So that's a great question. Uh, people need to do a little bit more uh, research into whether or not there's a study on the finished formulation. Got it. So this is one of the biggest um, misdirections in the probiotic space, right? Most companies will say, this is a researched probiotic. What they're actually saying is one or two of the strains in that mix have had studies on its own. It doesn't mean that if you bring it all together, it's actually going to provide any benefit, mm. right? In fact, they could compete with each other, knock out each other's functions, and so on. And most probiotics are inflammatory. This is another research study that was done by the APC. Most probiotics enhance inflammation in the body. Whoa. Because right? they enhance immune activation. They enhance immune activation. Your immune system, when they see these hordes of microbes coming through, you know, 50 billion, 60 billion coming through, turns on all the immunological responses, right? And this is why if you look at the world of practitioners of functional medicine, many of them don't use most probiotics for conditions like histamine intolerance or mast cell activation or SIBO because they found that most probiotics make it worse for these patients. Wow. Because they're already in an inflamed state. You throw in a probiotic, especially one of the kitchen sink ones, and it's gonna just enhance inflammation. So what you need is a probiotic that what we call silent. Not only does it not enhance inflammation, it actually enhances anti-inflammatory pathologies. So all those studies have been done on this psychobiotic, showing that not only does it not enhance inflammation, it upregulates IL-10. So people have to be very careful. I think one of the best ways to look at it, if you don't have the time to go to the company's websites and reach out to them and go, hey, you know, have you done research on your finished strains, is look at what 
practitioners are using, right? Uh, practitioners use products that they've kind of tried and talk to their colleagues about and, you know, look at your naturopaths, look at your local naturopaths, what are they using, right? They go through that clinical work. And, and for that reason, we've been working with clinicians and practitioners for the last 15 years or so. Yeah, it's amazing. You, know? you, you kind of touched on this, but are there any situations or health conditions where probiotics are not recommended? Um, I would say that like I wouldn't take one of those kitchen sink probiotics. Got it. Um, if a probiotic doesn't have a study on the finished formula to understand two things. One is how does it impact the rest of the microbiome? And number two, how does it impact the immune response, right? Then you could be doing things that are counteracting your, your, the progress you're trying to make. And if there isn't a study on the finished formula to demonstrate those two things, then I wouldn't take it, hmm. right? So I only take a couple of different probiotics myself. I think they're really important if they've been studied to be able to enhance your microbiome or support your immune system, yeah. right? Um, so for that reason, I think just taking a probiotic is just not a good idea. Like, you just don't go to the store and just buy something, right? It could work against you. Um, so taking a research probiotic is, is a, a, a really important thing. Now, even with research probiotics, some people that tend to be on immunosuppressants. Like if you're on biologics, for example, right? And you're, let's say you have Crohn's or colitis and your gastroenterologist has you on biologics, you really want to work with your doctor before just starting a probiotic. Mm. Um, transplant patients, which is a very low number of people, fortunately, um, they're on very strong immunosuppressants. We know probiotics will enhance the immune response, so you don't necessarily want to take one. Um, but if you're on biologics or your transplant patient, those are the ones where even research probiotics really work with your doctor before yeah. you start taking it. But general population, you shouldn't take any probiotic that hasn't had studies on what it. About, what about people with suspected overgrowth? Yeah, so SIBO, yeah. right? Uh, so SIBO, if you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, one of the key drivers of that overgrowth is stasis in the bowel. The bowel is not moving anymore, right? Uh, and the second feature of those bowels are that there's a shift in the type of microbe that is now native to the small intestine. The small intestine should have predominantly gram-positive bacteria. And now these individuals have gram-negative bacteria that are predominating the small intestine. Those gram-negative bacteria have LPS, which creates profound leakiness. That leakiness causes that endotoxin to move its way up the vagus nerve and lodge itself into an area called the dorsal vagal complex, where it stops the signals from the brain to the gut that tell the gut to move. Hmm. So now they have profound stasis. Their guts don't flex and bend and move, right? When they have profound stasis, what happens is you eat food, it stays in the small intestine for too long that gives the opportunity for microbes to start fermenting and producing uh, gas and so on, right? In addition, you've got gram-negative bacteria that also drive more inflammation, and you've got microbes in there that trigger the immune response anytime anything touches your system. This may be another ex uh, reason why when you drank soy at that time, whatever your health condition was, you might have had too many gram-negative bacteria in your small bowel so that this stimulus is coming through your, your, your mouth, your immune system goes, uh-oh, we got food coming through. This is one of the worst times for the gut is mm. when food comes through because you enhance microbial activity and all that. So your immune system starts gearing up and turning on inflammation throughout your body, mm. right? So you feel all of those things. Um, those individuals should use a probiotic that stops leaky gut, and they should also use a probiotic that works in the small intestine to compete against gram-negative bacteria. Wow. So spore-based probiotics, ones that have studies on this, can be profoundly impactful for those individuals. Does Just Thrive have a probiotic geared towards somebody that might have overgrowth? Yeah, the Just Thrive, the spore-based probiotic is is really utilized for that quite a bit. Wow. By lots of clinicians. Yeah. Ah, super yeah. interesting. Good to know. That's awesome. Well, dude, this was super fun. Uh, as I promised at the beginning of the episode, you are a wealth of knowledge. Thank and I'm you. sure my, my listeners um, derived a ton of value from this. I know that I did. And uh, I just want to put it out there for people that for a limited time, you can save 20% off a 90-day bottle of Just Thrive Probiotic or Just Calm, which is the psychobiotic that we've been talking about, at justthrivehealth.com with promo code GeniusLife. So thank you guys for that. Super, super generous. Um, before we wrap, where can people, because I'm sure... They're 
inevitably are going to be lingering questions. Where can people find you on social media? Yeah, so if you look at my uh, my handle on social on Instagram is Kieran Biome, uh, and I put out tons of information just to help empower people on understanding their guts, their ecosystem, and how to deal with it. Right, um, that's my passion. That's what I do. I, I I don't monetize that in any way at all. It's really just about sharing information. So if they look at Kieran Biome uh, and follow me there, they'll get a ton of information all all the time. And then if they message me there, I actually try to interact with people as much as I can Love through it. messages, right? I don't give medical advice, but I'll help you point you in the direction of things you should be looking at. Uh, and then, of course, Just Thrive Health on Instagram as well has tons of great information. Love it, man. Yeah, there's so much misinformation out there. And it's like the microbiome, it's like a, it's become a bit of a buzz term. Yeah. And there's still so many more unanswered questions than there are answers. And so whenever you have something like that, especially in a, in a space as commercialized as the wellness world has become there's just you know there's a lot of people making false claims mm-hmm. and and fear mongering and um and yeah so thank you for what you're doing because i mean you could tell that that you're you're like knee deep in the research and yeah, um, and we appreciate that here it's my pleasure and you know if you think about the microbiome it's um somewhere around five thousand papers are published every year wow which is insane how do you keep right? up and so you have to spend a lot of time in your nerd life reading this stuff <laughs> right and so um which which means that that the information is con- consistently evolving mm. and so you have to find somebody that's really knee deep in it as you said and kind of learn from what they're learning right um and there are a lot of options opportunist in the in our world as well who will take advantage of these situations and and create things that aren't necessarily helpful or beneficial but are trending mm. you know and so um you know our our goal is to really kind of give people the unvarnished th- truth about what's going on and what they can do to improve their life yeah love it love it well you're doing a great job hey if you like that video you need to check out this one here and i'll see you there